Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and for today's video I'm going to be uploading a vlog of when I went to the Queen Mary and it's just a whole bunch of footage of the tour I took and just looking around the Queen Mary so I hope you like it. back from war on this ship some of them unfortunately did not survive that journey home we don't have the figures though they're military records we have no access to those the 57 also does not include since the ship has been here, here in long beach there have been deaths since then as well so definitely more than 57. Uh, there's also a theory that people haunt places where they had happy memories and that makes sense to me if you had a choice would you go somewhere you like or somewhere you don't like seems fairly reasonable uh, there's also something called residual energy and that's where an event has occurred. And when I say event, I don't necessarily mean a big party or anything. Someone walking down a corridor is an event. It creates energy. And the energy created by that event is still somehow trapped here on the ship and cannot escape. So that's more like an imprint or an echo of something that's happened in the past, rather than a conscious spirit. Um, so there's three theories. Um, there's obviously plenty of others out there, but you know, there's a few to be getting on with there. Uh, but what I want to do now is give you a very brief sort of three minute history of the Queen Mary, because that's going to help put into context some of the stories you'll hear on the tour. So the ship was built at the John Brown shipyard in Clydebank, Scotland. Building began in 1930. The maiden voyage was 1936, sailing from Southampton in the south of England to New York, with a quick stop in Cherbourg in France on the way. She was designed to be the largest and fastest ship of her day, and she'd do that journey usually in four to five days, a time when most ships took five to six, sometimes even seven days, depending on the conditions outside. And in fact, the Queen Mary very quickly broke the four-day barrier. It's the ocean equivalent of breaking the four-minute mile. Her fastest time was in 1938, when she managed a crossing in three days, 20 hours, 42 minutes, an average speed of 31.69 knots. That's about 37 miles per hour. And for a ship, that's fast. Ships today come nowhere near that speed. So this was the way to travel. 1939, war broke out in Europe. The Queen Mary was then drafted into service by the British Admiralty as a troop carrying ship. And she'd go to different parts of the world, such as Australia, Singapore, India, Africa, bringing troops up into battle. At the end of 1941, the US joined the war, and from 1942, she carried troops from the US to the UK. She was designed to carry about 2,000 passengers. But during wartime, she was usually carrying 10,000, sometimes 12,000, sometimes 15,000. In fact, the Queen Mary still holds the world record for the most number of people on a single ocean voyage. And that was in July 1943, when 16,683 people squeezed onto this ship. When you take into account her speed and her size, it would have taken 21 other ships to do what the Queen Mary achieved during the war. So you can probably imagine what Adolf Hitler thought of this ship. He hated her. He was desperate to sink this ship. He sent submarines out to the North Atlantic to do just that. The captain who successfully sunk the ship would have been awarded the highest military honour in Germany, which was the Iron Cross with oak leaves, and on top of that, a nice tidy sum of a quarter of a million dollars. And in the 1940s, that was a fortune. Now, despite that, no one even got a shot on this ship. She was too fast. No one could find her, no one could catch her. So in 1945, the war ended. 
She had a couple more jobs to do before going back into civilian service. One job was to bring the troops home, but also a lot of those young men while abroad had met young ladies, got married, had little people. <laughs> so the Queen Mary then took part in what was known as Operation Diaper, also known as the Bride and Baby Shuttles, bringing those ladies and children to start their new lives in the US and Canada. 1947, the ship was returned to her former glory and went back to doing what she was designed to do. A quiet day, there was no one around. I heard a child say hi. No one around. Two hours later, I came back. Same thing happened again. Child said hi, no one around again. Um, I said hi back at this point. I got no response, but I then went down to our break room and sat, I was having coffee, someone tapped me on the shoulder. There was no one there. Now, was it that child following me? I don't know, no idea, but I have to say, and I'm being absolutely honest here, I did not feel scared, worried, anything like that. Um, I was more interested, actually, than worried. Um, I have to say, if um, that child had said something a little less positive, <laughs> maybe, I don't know, um, you will die. <laughs> I may have freaked out at that point. But no, high is a good thing, so I'm quite happy with that one. By the way, this is the first class nursery where first class passengers who drop their children off. Do you notice how the children's playroom is right next to the adults' playroom? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely by design. <laughs> Same in all three classes, good old Cunard. Drop the kids off, go and have fun. Okay, come this way. And everyone in the group heard it. Hammering. Coming from around here. There was no one around. Now that's something often people have reported, the sound of someone working down here. I don't know if it's repeating a construction worker, maybe someone doing maintenance on the boilers, I really don't know. But yeah, that was an interesting one. Again, I was more interested than worried about it. Some people were getting a little bit you know, nervous, but no, I, I just find it interesting personally. Just move around a bit further. They were gonna take that number as a souvenir. Oh. Yeah, we realized that was gonna be an ongoing problem, so we didn't replace it. Now, back in the 70s and 80s, B340 was a room like any other. People would stay here, you know, people would book that room out, but, management did start noticing a pattern of complaints about the room. People reported lights turning on and off by themselves, water turning on and off by itself, the plumbers and electricians would come along, never found anything wrong. People reported bed sheets being pulled off the bed. In 1988, a member of the housekeeping team was in there, she'd vacuum, she'd clean, she'd put fresh bed sheets on the bed. The last thing she had to do was step out into the corridor here to her cart, grab some towels, take them to the bathroom. So she was out of the room for what, 10, 15 seconds? And when she got back inside, all of those fresh bed sheets she'd made were in a pile on the floor. That was the final straw. Management <laughs> did not want a reputation as a haunted hotel. So after that incident, the decision was made to close down B340. It then became an office for the finance team. <laughs> that went well. <laughs> it lasted six months and then they wouldn't go in there anymore. And after that, it was just left as an empty space. So, what's going on? Well, we did some research to see if we could find a cause for these hauntings. We did find an interesting record from May 1966. There was a lady travelling on her own in that room. It's recorded that she got woken up in the night by someone pulling at the bed sheets, and when she fully came out of her sleep, she saw a man standing at the end of the bed. She screamed very loudly, she hit the button next to the bed, which called the steward. A light would come on outside the room. The promise was that a steward would be there within 60 seconds. The steward happened to be in the corridor anyway, so he not only saw the lights, he heard the scream as well. He ran straight to the room, let himself in, and the lady was in there shouting about there being a man in the room. No one there. The steward looked around anywhere this person could have hidden, nothing. He certainly hadn't left the room. The steward would have seen him in the corridor. Anyway, this doesn't explain why the room's haunted. It's just an incident. So we look back beyond May 1966, so clearly something's happened here. We look for our records, B340, B340, B... nothing, complete blank. But then we took our research in a slightly different direction, <coughs> because we realised that by May 1966, the Queen Mary had been in operation for 30 years. And in 30 years, things do change. Modifications are made. A couple of times, the room numbering system was tweaked. There were times rooms were taken out of service to become storage rooms, and towards the end of the Queen Mary's life, which was from sort of late 50s onwards, they did actually knock through small rooms to make big rooms. They actually reduced the capacity because jet travel was taken over. They wanted to provide like nicer rooms, if you like. So we looked at an original plan, and we found that B340 did used to be three separate rooms. B222, B224, B224. 
B226. We then found a record from 1949. A passenger died, apparently in his sleep, in B226. The theory now, he is the person who does not like other people staying in that room. Now, the, the records of this death are actually incomplete. We don't have a name, but now don't ask me why, but he's become affectionately known as Walter. <laughs> but yeah, Walter doesn't seem to like people in there. Anyway, word of mouth started spreading about hauntings on this ship. People would come to the ship asking if they to be, could be taken to the haunted sites. Uh, our first management really <coughs> were not wanting to do this. It's a unique hotel. We're not doing ghosts. But the demand became so great, the tour was born. <laughs> and here we are. And it's proved very successful. <laughs> and management like that. <laughs> and the next natural step, people were asking if they could stay inside a haunted room. So towards the end of 2017, the decision was made to refurnish B340. And we finally reopened on Friday the 13th of April, no. 2018. Yes, good old marketing team on the ball there. Now, since we have reopened, there has been a lot of activity reported in that room. An example, about two months ago, a couple were staying in the room. They actually told us they didn't believe in ghosts. They just said they wanted to stay there just to say they'd been there, you'd done it, you know. So, um, but one point in the night, they made a phone call to the hotel desk. They said, yes, we get it, it's the haunted room. We're actually very tired now, please, can you turn your special effects off? Yeah. <laughs> the response was, there are no special effects in the room. To which they replied, yeah, yeah, we get it. We're actually really sleepy, please just turn them off. It took a while to convince them there were no special effects in that room. About four months ago, a lady stepped into the room. She stepped straight back out. She said she felt a very heavy pressure on her chest. Now that is something a lot of people have experienced in lots of different haunted sites all around the world. Purely a precautionary measure in case there's an obstruction up ahead that they couldn't see. And they've done this many times before. It's not the first time they'd sailed through fog. Up on the bridge there's a panel. It's about this big. It shows the location of the doors and their numbers. Each number would light up to show that that door had closed successfully. And on this occasion, all the numbers lit up. Except for one. Door number 13. This one here. And I know it had to be 13 of all the numbers on this ship, but unfortunately this is true. Now there could have been any number of reasons why that light didn't come on up on the bridge. Maybe the mechanics of the door had failed. Maybe there's an obstruction here, stopping the door from closing properly. Or it could be something silly, like the lights on the panel didn't work. But someone had to come down here to see if they could find a problem. And what they found was not a pleasant sight. They found an 18 year old engine room worker crushed in this door. There was no sign of life, but he was given morphine just in case he was then rushed to the ship's hospital where he was pronounced dead. There's just no surviving that sort of injury. Now, I do know his name. I am deliberately not mentioning his name though because when we did start these tours, his family did request that we do not identify him. So out of respect for them, I won't. Um, all things being equal, he would still be around today. He'd be 71 years old. He is still seen and heard in this area though. He has dark hair, he wears a blue boiler suit. People do say they've seen him peeking his head around the corners. People say they've heard footsteps when there's no one there. Sounds of leisurely whistling when there's no one here. Physical contact has taken place, usually in the form of a pat on the back, sometimes fingers on the face. Now I have heard that on a few of these occasions it did leave an oil stain which then disappeared fairly quickly. Now something that actually used to happen down here when the ship was in operation was if someone was looking too clean, one of their colleagues might come up to them with their dirty oily hand, give them a big pat on the back, or to be less subtle, you know, get them on the face. Ha ha, you're dirty now. So maybe he's still playing that game. In fact, um, it was like, you know, seven months ago now, I was taking this tour, I came to this spot, I told the story, I carried on with the tour. At the end of the tour, someone in the group came up to me and told me that he didn't believe in ghosts before the tour. <laughs> But he said that while we were here, someone patted him on the back. He turned around expecting to see his wife or daughter behind him having a bit of fun. But he said when he turned around, there was no one there. Um, he said when he saw where his wife and daughter were, he said it could not possibly have been them. He was standing at the bottom of the escalator there, by the way, just so, in case you feel anything. Right, right, right. I hope you guys enjoyed that video and got to learn a little bit more about the Queen Mary. And... Sorry that I'm, I did this intro and outro so much later, but I really wanted to get this video up. So I hope you like it. Don't forget to subscribe down below if you haven't, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye! Mwah.